So I just was a writer, just writing the story. And then I had a person called Role Model. I sent it to this actor I really like, named Mel Gibson, who's always been a champion for me, and you know, a full-blown fuck up too. Hey girls, I've been fortunate to have had many great experiences in my life. If you're a full fuck up like what I am, uh, you only got a couple of guys to look towards. I think it's important to work hard and give back to you. Charity involvement is one of the things that makes me happy. So I needed somebody to look at, and he was a guy. I also love making music, acting, and meeting my fans. What do you love? What inspires you? Unfortunately, it was recalled. This video was sponsored by CuriosityStream. Watch the extended cut of this video on Nebula when you sign up for CuriosityStream using my link in the description. Even Stevens is a Disney Channel original TV series that premiered on June 17, 2000, and ran for three seasons, airing its final episode on June 2, 2003, and putting a bow on it with a TV movie that premiered on the 13th. By far the most well-known project of creator Matt Dearborn, the show follows the Stevens family, who are charmingly weird, tremendously close, and impeccably high achievers. Except for baby brother Lewis, a deadbeat class clown with a kooky hijink for every day of the week. The heart of the show is Lewis's snitting but ultimately loving rivalry with middle sister Ren, a popular straight-A student with a calendar jam-packed full of extracurriculars who is often referred to as the queen of the school. And this is what we come here for, the confetti trampoline that launched the careers of two then relatively unknown actors by the names of Christy Carlson Romano and Shia LaBeouf. Let's be honest, even Stevens is a goddamn revelation. This show is part of the same generation of sitcoms that produced Malcolm in the Middle, single cam joints that embrace the camera and the edit as conspicuous players with their own comedic voices, with this show in particular pioneering a time-lapse style that would dominate Disney's lineup for at least my young adulthood. The cast, child and adult stars alike, is dynamite, the sense of humor is delightfully bizarre and entirely its own thing, and the show possesses a sensibility that, while not not feeling its 20 years, has aged pretty dang well, all things considered. Plus, it features an embarrassment of himbos who went criminally underappreciated in their day. Watching this show as an adult, I can't help but come up with all sorts of theories about why I kinda missed out on it as a kid. Because I did. I saw an episode here and there, I probably watched the movie on the night it premiered, but this was never a show I made sure to finish all my homework for. I remember feeling like it was old by the time I started watching Disney Channel at all, but looking at the dates, that's obviously not right. Lizzie McGuire, which was my absolute favorite show of all time as soon as I started watching it, was basically concurrent, premiering just six months later in January of 2001, and both shows ended basically at the same time in the summer of 2003. Lizzie McGuire, or Elle McGee as it was known in the Crone household, didn't technically air its series finale until Valentine's Day of 2004, but its third to last episode had premiered the previous August. So okay, maybe it was just something about the show's content that didn't resonate with me. I had pretty solid relationships with both of my sisters. The whole sibling rivalry thing didn't really feel like so much of a thing Thing, at least not yet. Like, I don't want to give myself too much credit, we sniped at each other plenty. But for the most part, I had rock-solid friendships with each of my younger sisters, while they were constantly at each other's throats. I was sort of the Donnie of our family in that respect, and he was rarely more than a supporting player in a B-plot, not to mention he liked gym class. Okay, sure, but pretty much every live-action Disney Channel sitcom nabbed the format of the obnoxious sibling whose job it is to piss off the other one. Lizzie had Matt, Raven had Corey, Phil had Pim, Cody had Zach, Miley had Jackson, Alex had Justin. I watched all of them more or less religiously just the same. No, maybe the problem was that I identified too much with Ren. I 100% was the tryhard who would weep in the bathroom if I pulled a 3.98 for one quarter, who spent the after school hours zipping around to piles and piles of activities and probably would have gone ahead and ratted out the kids betting on hamster races the one time I landed in detention for something silly and totally not my fault. I had a classmate in fifth grade who called me perfect totally earnestly one time and never ever let it go because it was the only thing that ever got a 
rise out of me. I objectively had so much more in common with Ren than with the highly socially intelligent, trend-conscious Lizzie McGuire, the pretty darn well-liked girl who probably would have let her grades take a hit for the right social opportunity and had to shove off advances from geeky boys and actually had half a shot with the school's number one dreamboat and ultimately did snag the eye of her floppily adorable bananas smart best friend. I liked Lizzie. I probably wished I were Lizzie, but I saw myself in Ren Stevens. Just not in a good way. Ren was the person I knew other people saw in me. But not in the way her parents, or Ruby, or Donnie, or Principal Wexler, or even Tom and Twitty saw her. As a smart, collected, ambitious, most likely to succeed leader who was maybe a little much sometimes, but ultimately did the hashtag crushing of it. They saw me the way Lewis saw her, as an obnoxious, snot-nosed, uncool, teacher's pet, goody-two-shoes tryhard. It blew my mind that the show could frame a girl like that as popular, could have her dating a football player and winning best personality in a landslide. That didn't feel like the world I lived in. And what's more, I didn't want to be Ren. I wanted to be smart, sure, and I wanted good grades and for my teachers to like me, at least to the extent that I was terrified of the alternative, but I didn't want to be in charge of stuff. And more importantly, I didn't want to be a shiny-faced, khaki-wearing normie. I wanted to be Tawny. Cool, artsy, insightful Tawny, with emotional intelligence coming out of her ears and a couple of best friends she'd trash talk to no end, but ultimately would absolutely die for and zero fucks to give about anyone else. Deep in my heart, that's who I felt like. I mean, it's not like I was doing it because of Even Stevens, but I dressed a whole lot like Tawny. I don't think I ever had the ovaries to rock eight pigtail braids, but that sort of kooky, quirky, edgy, but not quite hot topic edgy, time-traveling Victorian vampire rock star vibe was pretty much exactly what I was aiming for at all times. It did not work for me. I acted like Ren Stevens, but I was the opposite of popular. And I dressed like Tawny Dean, but no boy was ever gonna fight my best friend for me. Everyone who had an opinion I knew about, honestly my friends included once I made some of those, thought I was a square-ass weirdo and nobody invited me to go anywhere ever and I cared a whole hell of a lot. Maybe in another timeline I could have seen the world of Even Stevens as a fan to see about a better version of middle school where insufferable nerds do run shit starting in seventh grade. I could have seen Tawny as the goddamn blueprint of what to do with all the fucks I was giving, but who's got that kind of self-awareness at 13? It felt like lies and it felt like it was mocking me and that is not what I came here for. Or, you know, Maybe it's because it appears to have aired at 6.30 p.m. and my family was still eating dinner at that point, who knows. But why ever I didn't watch the show in my Disney Channel days, I found my way back to it in the era of Disney+. Plus. And wow does it hit different in the steaming heap of paratext that is the year of our Lord 2021. For example, did you know that Christy Carlson Romano has a YouTube channel? Which, you know, could be par for the course, it being the end times and all. But no, the intro video for this channel was released on June 20th, 2019, a full eight months before a pandemic sent all manner of traditional media stars scrambling to navigate the self-produced internet. No, Girlfriend was doing this presumably because she actually just felt like it. The channel features numerous running shows, including Mom Possible, Christy Vlogs and its subset Ren Reacts, Snacks and Reacts, aka aggressively edited Hot Ones Yoink. Okay, are you ready to do our, our fifth and last and final drawer of sourness? Yes. This one's gonna probably yes. be pretty sour. Date Night, aka The Straits Are Okay, We Swear, We Swear! Wait, we have got to go through Starbucks in this thing. And The Blindfold Bake Off. Girl's been busy! But the channel's sometimes literal bread and butter is Christy's Kitchen Throwback. Hashtag CKT. We are stars of properties that strike the same nostalgic chord as Romano's oeuvre join her to cook recipes inspired by the roles they're best known for. And there's just, there's a lot going on here. I don't really know what most of it is. Like, number one, these recipes are not that good. Who knew? Burger meat, some cheese, and a couple of, couple of spices. Mm-hmm. 
really makes a delicious dish. I mean, they're fine. There is the occasional true banger, like when Ty Hodges, who played Larry Beal on Even Stevens and grew up to be a professional chef, at least for a time, brings a recipe from his actual food truck, and you can see how much Romano and her husband are actually, like, surprised that they're eating something restaurant quality. Is it good? Let me see my real quick. This is freaking amazing, man. Because for the most part, we are squarely in the totally serviceable realm where your classic white picket fence middle American family has gathered around the table with a pre-bagged salad and a basket of brown and serves on a decade of Tuesday nights. I'm like, that's fine. I'm definitely showing some privilege that I graduated high school basically knowing how to do this kind of cooking because I had the kind of childhood where my mom and my grandma cooked for me and taught me along the way. I would have zero qualms about a friend cooking a vegetable vegetarian version of any of this for me. If you're a person who has access to a kitchen but mostly lives off instant ramen and cold cereal, there's definitely a good recipe or two in here for you. But oh my god, maybe put that in a bigger pan, I'm just saying. But if you're coming in expecting anything that lives up to the level of, like, most channels successfully making recipe videos on YouTube in 2021, this is kind of your grandma's church fundraiser cookbook sitting on the shelf next to the collected works of everyone who quit Bon Appetit last summer. The vibe is way less of an actual cooking show than, like, the cooking segment of a morning talk show. Which of course makes sense, because the draw isn't really the kitchen so much as the throwback. The reason these videos can rake in six and occasionally seven digit view counts is the where are they now factor. While they cook, the stars reenact scenes from the properties that made them famous. I don't even like birds, okay? I think they're dirty, dumb, and boring! Young lady. You are lucky that birds have notoriously bad hearing. Theorize where their characters would be now. They would have went to, they were soulmates. Yeah. They were, and we probably went to prom together. Reminisce and share stories from behind the scenes. After the show, I didn't eat bacon for like three months. <laughs> I had, I had nightmares, I had cold sweats. Oh, my poor baby! Answer trivia questions about their former shows with youtube -y consequences for failure, and bond over the shared experiences of being former Disney kids. Did you have that one guy? Stephen Blanchard. He was the beast. Was, was he, he your beast? beast? We oh had the same beast! Oh my god, we kissed the same boy! <laughs> my god, what was Annalisa Vanderpool on when she filmed this episode, and where do I get some? <laughs> That's Italian, you're welcome. At its best, the show is a cute nostalgic cash-in verging on genuinely touching. Seeing connections between people who have this really specific shared experience of having been child stars for the Disney Channel has this element of fun to it that cuts a little deeper than the pure nostalgia factor. You know that audition room? The yeah, lobby? I think so. The, what is it, 23rd floor? It's basically where all children's, you can taste the tears yes. on that floor. <laughs> yeah. And the joy. It's this thing where the most boring aspects of stars, they're not like us at all, circle all the way back around to an actually grounded version of stars, they're just like us, when they're not being filtered through the lens of what traditional media thinks the unwashed masses want. Wait, was Shirley Grant, did Shirley Grant rep you too? Yes, she did. Yo! Yo uh, Shirley Grant was this like um, uh, agent to all the young yeah. East Coast actor kids. Here's the deal. Listen, your kid's gonna be a Here's star. Here's how you're gonna be famous. Most of the episodes featuring fellow Even Steven stars are truly sweet, with Lauren Frost being a particular standout for that sweet, sweet parasocial dopamine. I never got to do this. Thanks for watching Disney Channel. Um, since you said that you've never been able to do it, let's do it now. Great. <sighs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's my moment! But um, okay, there's also an undeniable vibe here. Between some of the more middling episodes of CKT and most of the rest of this channel, there's something hanging heavy in the air that lands about halfway between Charlie Day's presumably satirical account of Christoph Waltz breaking out the rubber chickens to prove he could hang with the funny guys and woman at your high school reunion who kinda knows she peaked at 17 and is gonna be fine with it until her fifth glass of Sutter home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember that. I kind of can't help but wonder why. What's going on here? What brought this on? Is Disney not coming through with the residuals? Did her agent drop her? It's not like she hasn't been getting consistent work, and honestly, revisiting Even Stevens has reminded me what an absolutely underrated actress she's always been. No. No more popcorn, no more lectures, because I am covered in oatmeal! And she's 
making a shot for shot remake of a scene she did on TV 20 years ago in her living room with children who look about the right age to star in a 2021 reboot, presumably under her own steam and with her own money. She made this into a t-shirt. She has a Patreon. No, wait, okay, she doesn't have a Patreon anymore, but she did at least as recently as February. Wow, I hope she's doing okay. Anyway, what is going on here? In May of 2019, about a month before Romano's first video, Kim Possible and Ron Stoppable Make The Nako was posted to her channel. Well, the first video since this influencer makeover, at the time that video was posted, the page still included a handful of music videos from her Disney days that have since been privated. Teen Vogue ran a personal essay from Romano discussing the breakdown that followed her child star days. Many of you know me as the girl from that TV show or movie you saw once on the Disney Channel. Maybe you saw me on Broadway or in a Lifetime movie. I am an actress, and if you were going to define my brand, you might say I was perfect or pulled together. I'm here to throw a wrench at that image. While many witnessed my co-star Shia LaBeouf struggle publicly, I have largely suffered in silence. I am not a victim, but I have never been perfect or pulled together as my reputation or the success of my young adulthood might suggest. During a period of time in my life, I grappled with depression, drinking, and more desperate to find fixes for how I felt. Romano goes on to describe circling back to finish college, meeting her now husband Brendan Rooney in a screenwriting class, and the sense that Rooney and their two children have brought her back from the brink. I haven't had a drink since before my first pregnancy, and am going to continue to abstain from alcohol so that I can continue to make clear-headed decisions that keep me on the right path. All that matters now is my amazing family. When I look back, I can see that's all I ever wanted. I'm also in control of my career. The beauty of the entertainment industry today is that you can create what you want to, a privilege that we didn't have when I was coming up. With YouTube and the other social media platforms, smart, savvy people with talent can do it all themselves. Even those who are established are crossing over into making content this way because there's no red tape to cut through, myself included. Since I'm obsessed with cooking, my team and I are officially launching my YouTube series, Christie's Kitchen Throwback, on June 27th. I feel that. This sounds a whole lot like my own account of how I got into and why I have stuck with online video. That's kind of, I think, what's really kept me going is just like, it's a creative outlet that no one has to give me permission to do. And I'm not even carrying the baggage of being a former child star, obviously. So why is it so hard for me to accept that genuine joy and artistic freedom are the driving force behind Celebrity Kitchen. This is another series running on Romano's channel in which she cooks yet more okay recipes while doing okay celebrity impressions. I love brain. I wish I had one. It is 2020. These videos are baffling to me. There are definitely moments where Romano's acting chops shine through. It is a joy to watch her power through when she looks like she's gonna break but always holds it together. But also, why? B-A-N-A-N-A-S. What is this? Why am I here? Why can't I stop watching this? Is this a good impression? I'm thinking of all the people I hate when I cut this chicken. I honestly don't even know anymore. Wait, this is scripted? Jeez. But Celebrity Kitchen is also the source of the single best video on the entire channel, and I promise I mean that entirely genuinely, which is currently titled Christy Carlson Romano Cosplays Shia LaBeouf. The team has clearly been doing some A-B testing on this series. They all used to have titles implying that the actual celebrity was on the show. This one was something like Shia LaBeouf destroys beef with Christy Carlson Romano. Get it? because he's notoriously difficult to work with and the recipe is literally a giant hunk of beef, see? But whoa, I don't know if it's just the slightly more striking than usual work being done by the hair and makeup and wardrobe here, but this, th this is good. Charlotte Sunset. There is some low hanging fruit. Let's do it, let's do it, let's just do it. But there are also some truly excellent jokes. Oh no, oh no, 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 no! No! No, 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 no! No, 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 I think it's fine. This is really good. Not only are they breaking cinematic rules, 
They're defying the rules of nature. This is the kind of result you get from a genuinely talented actress impersonating a person she spent three years in a room with, growing up like actual siblings. Let me ask you something, Phil. Let me ask you something. What does garlic butter have in it? Garlic and butter. And then is it hot or cold, Phil? Is it hot or cold, man? The mannerisms and the tone of voice are so well observed that I honestly forget at times that I'm not actually looking at Shia LaBeouf. Well, guess what? I'm gonna honor you by honoring you, okay, man? Because of course, if I were, this would all be going quite differently. While Christy Carlson Romano has been reckoning with her child star past through a cute YouTube cooking channel, Shia LaBeouf made Honey Boy, a discourse and awards baity independent film which LaBeouf wrote while in court-mandated rehab, which started shooting just two weeks after he completed the program, and in which he plays a character very transparently based on his own father, opposite Noah Jupe as a character very transparently based on LaBeouf himself during the period when Even Stevens was filmed. It's a movie demonstrating significantly more self-awareness than the character Alex in the book Postcards from the Edge, but falling short of Carrie Fisher writing Postcards from the Edge, perhaps the day comes for us all when we'll be held up alongside the brilliant space mother of laughing through the pain and be found wanting. Except for the part where she dedicated a whole chapter of her memoir to defending Michael Jackson. I think we can all do better than that. I digress. Honey Boy, I will be honest, doesn't do all that much for me. I can appreciate the craft of it. Alma Harrell has directed it absolutely beautifully, but it just doesn't hit anywhere deeper than that for me. To be clear, I suspect that's a me problem, and I take no issue with art that is deeply personal and therapeutic to the point where it borders on self-indulgent. Obviously. It's not only some of my favorite to make, but also of which to be in the audience. There is power in having a soul bared before you, and I do not doubt that this movie has spoken to many, many people on that level. What I am saying is that Shia LaBeouf, turned his rehab therapy journal into a movie in which he plays his own abusive father so explicitly that an actor playing a version of himself looks him in the eye and says, I wanna make a movie about you. And proceeded to start dating the actress playing his 14 year old self's love interest and abusing her so cruelly, grossly, and thoroughly, allegedly, that I can barely read the accounts without vomiting. And I look at all of that and say, yeah, you know what? That tracks. Why do I feel like Shia LaBeouf could start a nostalgia cash-in cooking slash talk show YouTube channel and I'd still have to listen to a five-part podcast on the nature of reality and authenticity and anthropology about it? Why do I feel like Christy Carlson Romano could finish her documentary about the adult lives of child stars that clearly comes from a place of deep, deep personal connection and trauma and it would go straight to streaming with minimal fanfare and I'd still be questioning why she felt the need to do this with her life? Why does all of this feel so, so familiar? Hi. My original script for this video included a section on a novel that Christy Carlson Romano wrote in 2006 with some downright eerie parallels to all of the everything happening in this video. I really, really like that section, and I think it makes the video better in every way, except that it takes about five extra minutes to get to the meat of that nostalgic clickbaity hook. And on an algorithmically driven platform like YouTube, that is just not going to fly. So if you'd like to check out the director's cut of this video and generally support work that is a little too weird for this platform, allow me to tell you about Nebula. And yes, this is a darling that I've had to kill in the final hours of this edit, so I'm about to be wearing a different shirt for the rest of this ad read. Nebula is a creator-owned streaming service where cool people you already like, like Mia Mulder, Patrick H. Willems, People Make Games, and yours truly can make the stuff we want to make in the way it wants to be made instead of the way that YouTube wants us to make it. You can support independent creators and get access to our entire libraries, including extended cuts, exclusive videos, and even entire new shows, all without ads or sponsor reads, when you sign up using our bundle 
bundle with Curiosity Stream. Curiosity Stream is a subscription-based streaming service with thousands of documentary and nonfiction titles, including Winnebago Man, where filmmaker Ben Steinbauer goes looking for the man behind a viral meltdown that went viral at a time when it had to be passed around on physical VHS tapes. I don't want to give away anything more than that. It is a delightfully twisty journey, 12 out of 10. The Curiosity Stream and Nebula bundle is honestly the best deal in streaming any day of the week. And if you haven't signed up yet, there is literally no better time to do it than right now because Curiosity Stream is on sale for Earth Day. If you sign up by going to curiositystream.com slash Laura Crone or following my link in the description, you'll get 41% off your membership for an annual total of 1179 and Nebula included for as long as you stay a subscriber. That's less than a dollar a month. That's bananas. Even if you miss the sale, it's still a killer deal and it's a great way to learn something new and support independent creators. All the cool kids are doing it. Thank you so much to my patrons for making projects like this possible with an extra special thank you to Andreas Evans, Danny, Exceedingly Lizzie, Ilona Concetta, LL Milktray, Michelle, Richard Lawson, and Ronnie Rocket. If you'd like to help support these videos directly, you can go over to patreon.com slash laurakrone, or you can throw me a one-time tip on PayPal or coffee.